13 U.S. service members lost at the terror attack at Karzai International Airport in Kabul. That was the one that caused by Joe Biden's reckless exit from Afghanistan. And that feckless, dementia-ridden piece of just sent my son to die. Well, there is clearly a lot of anger in the United States at President Joe Biden right now. And just seven months into his presidency, his approval ratings are at an all-time low. Not only has he presided over a chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, his critics say he's failed at the one thing he used to excel at, being good with people, being empathetic. Some of the families of the 13 U.S. Marines and soldiers killed last month in Kabul are complaining that he disrespected them when they met, rolling his eyes, being impatient and totally fake. Their words, not mine. They also say he looked at his watch several times during the ceremony for their sons and daughters who were brought home from Afghanistan in coffins. Here's how events unfolded since that terrible attack last month. Every day we're on the ground is another day we know that ISIS-K is seeking to target the airport and attack both U.S. and allied forces and innocent civilians. Following the breaking news out of Afghanistan, getting reports about an explosion outside the Kabul airport. A suspected suicide bomber detonating near one of the main entrances of the airport. 13 U.S. service members killed in this attack. Best kid in the world. You couldn't ask for any better. This is the deadliest attack on U.S. forces in Afghanistan in more than a decade. There were multiple Afghan citizens who were also killed or injured. ISIS-K, or the Islamic State in the Khorasan, has claimed responsibility. We will hunt you down and make you pay. This tragedy should never have taken place. It should never have happened. And it would not have happened if I were your president. And that feckless, dementia-ridden piece of just sent my son to die. These were America's finest, our national treasure. And quite frankly, they deserve so much better than this. He looked down at his watch on every last one, all 13. He looked down at his watch. You met with Biden over the weekend. How did that go? It, it didn't go well. Um, he talked a bit more about his own son than he did my son, and that, that didn't sit well with me. I was able to stand about 15 seconds of his fake scripted apology, and I had to walk away. We could have gotten out of Afghanistan in a way that did not embarrass our country. And obviously, there's 13 American families that would have preferred us take that route. Well, what happened when the president met the families, only they really know. But the complaint about him looking at his watch appears to be borne out by the video. Towards the end of the ceremony, Biden glanced at his watch before putting his hands behind his back. Some of the Gold Star families say they saw him looking at his watch several times, perhaps five times. But for the record, there is only video of this one occasion. Now, Biden's White House press secretary, Jen Psaki, was asked about this, but she didn't really address the question. Was the president looking at his watch, and does he have a message to those people uh, who felt that they were offended? Well, I would say his message to all of the family members who were there, those who were not uh, even in attendance, is uh, that he is uh, grateful to their uh, sons and daughters, the sacrifice uh, they made to the country, that he knows uh, firsthand what it's like to lose a child and the fact that no one can tell you uh, anything or say anything or there's no words that are going to fill that hole that is left by that. Uh, he's not going to speak to and I'm not going to speak to the private conversations. Of course, they have the right uh, to convey whatever they would like. Well, she's right, of course. Free speech is supposed to be guaranteed in America, but tell that to the Gold Star mother, Shana Chappelle. Her son was 20-year-old Kareem Nikui an Iranian-American from Southern California and one of the 13 Americans killed on August the 26th. She found her Instagram account deleted by Facebook after she complained about her meeting with President Biden. She wrote that Biden tried to interrupt her to talk about his own son and that he rolled his eyes in his head as if he was annoyed with her. The Trump supporter also wrote, 
that Biden had her son's blood on his hands. Later, after a bit of an outcry on social media, a Facebook spokesman said, we express our deepest condolences to Ms. Chappelle and her family. Her account was incorrectly deleted, and we have since restored it. Now, bear in mind that the Taliban's main spokesman, Zabihullah Mujahid, has an active Twitter account with over 390,000 followers. Meanwhile, the 45th president of the United States still can't use his Twitter account, which was being followed by 32.6 million people. He's also frozen out of his Facebook and Instagram accounts. Now, his successor, the 46th president, Joe Biden, has seen his approval ratings tumble over the past couple of months. Uh, this ABC poll shows 52% of Americans approved of his leadership back in April. But as of September the 1st, he's dropped eight percentage points, down to 44%, the lowest point since he took office just over seven months ago. Interestingly, another poll out recently shows that Biden would lose to Trump, albeit narrowly, if they were the candidates in the election in 2024. OK, let's bring in our guest now. And David Morey is a political strategist who worked with Biden on the campaign trail back in the 80s and has known him for the past 40 years. Tara Kopp is a senior Pentagon correspondent for an online military publication called Defense One and has been attending Pentagon briefings throughout the withdrawal. Fanu Malat is a US citizen, originally from Afghanistan, was an interpreter for the US Army. He's now trying to get his family out of Afghanistan. And Kristen Ruby is a digital media analyst in New York. Thank you and welcome to all four of you. David, I'd like to start with you. You've known President Biden on and off for 40 years. You've worked with him closely. He's now being seen, by some at least, uh, as, as failing that, failing to have that, you know, that quality that set him out amongst all the other candidates, that ability to empathize. What's gone wrong here? Well, I think even bigger than that is the issue of competency. This is hard to defend the way the the way the withdrawal was done. And I think, you know, this administration's paying a price, as you know, in the polling numbers, 45.5% real clear politics average, only three in 10 approve of the way we pulled out. This is Biden's number one strength, empathy. And, and um, you know, I think that I've been in these situations at, in, at Arlington. There are a lot of, to say the raw nerves in the room is an understatement, right? So, you know, who knows what happened? The, the White House, I think, should and needs to reach out to these families. I know some people didn't like Joe Biden before yeah. uh, this tragedy, and, and if I were them, I'd be pretty angry myself, and I would like Joe Biden a lot less. So it's hard to tell if he's lost that touch. I noticed after Ida and the touring around yesterday in the Northeast, he was hugging, and he was the Biden that we know. And, and you know, those of us who know Joe Biden, final point, he really does feel this stuff very deeply. So he might have gotten defensive in that room if somebody right. could. Who knows what happened with all that emotion, those raw nerves? You know, he's got to pull his way out of this. The administration has to do better. Well, some of these uh, Gold Star families uh, were clearly Trump supporters. They were appearing on Fox and other conservative outlets. But on the other hand, uh, they did have a point, didn't they, when they said, you know, that you sent them there in these conditions needlessly, this, this withdrawal could have been done better, and then you wouldn't have put their lives at risk like this. Yeah, I mean, let's pull back and then zoom in. Four administrations, four U-turns, 20 years of mishandling, 10 different Afghanistan strategies, according to Ambassador Robert Newman, over 20 years, what could go wrong? You know, this has been a mega max failure. When you pull back at the aperture here, you open it up, for administrations, we have a lot to learn here. But this uh, this withdrawal, the way it was done, the timing, you know, it, you can't really defend it. This was a, an American policy. This is a, a, a crisis. I, I think of it as the Bay of Pigs, and the administration has to pull its way out of this. They did a good job once they got going on the 124,000 evacuations. That's, that's a, a world record in terms of evacuations, but it's not enough, and we have to get every last man and woman out of there. That's going to be key for the competence ah. and the credibility of yeah. this administration. We'll come back to that in a moment. Tarkov, I just want to uh, say, you know, this isn't the first time that we've had uh, Gold Star families complaining about their experiences uh, with Joseph Biden. Uh, back in 2016, when he was vice president, um, Charlotte Loquasto, uh, who lost her son, uh, Tyler Lubelt, uh, he was just 20 years of age at the time. Uh, she said she had a very unpleasant experience with him, uh, echoing similar criticisms. We've just spoken with her. Have a listen. I expected a more humane 
um, interaction, a more sincere empathy um, because of the commonality that we had with him in him himself losing a son. It was more plastic and inauthentic with his demeanor and his tone and his lackadaisical disposition, um, almost as if we were at a meet and greet and not at a event or a funeral home in a sense. And that's where we were at to welcome our son back home to the States. I had the opportunity to ask the question, how do we keep this from happening again? And Vice President Biden's response to me was, well, they're a 14th century country. They don't want us there. They're never going to change. That wasn't an answer. Atara, in the defense community, the department and amongst veterans and so on, what is the general opinion of Joe Biden? So an interesting point to make about the return of all of these remains is that the, the return and the transfer case ceremony didn't used to be televised. It used to be a private ceremony and the president could attend, the secretary of defense could attend. You know, they opened it up to media and that eye and having all everybody witness and interpret what they think is going on in somebody's head based on body language, you know, has really opened up this can of worms to politicize what is one of the saddest moments in a family's life, seeing their child come home. Uh, and become political fodder for both sides. We actually had um, a letter from scores of Gold Star families published yesterday asking for the end of this politicization. You know, this is one of the worst moments in their lives. This, that what they need is support. What they need is the care for the widow or widower and the dependents. And they don't need to be pawns that are put out on these networks to be mm. used to either criticize a policy or not or defend that policy. It wasn't just uh, an emotional response, though. Some of them said that they felt that their children, men and women, had died in vain. And, you know, the manner of the withdrawal was what killed them. And, and not, you know, it, it didn't have to be that way, is what they were saying. There needs to be such a deep dive and accountability here. It has surprised a lot of people that we have not seen resignations within the administration over the handling of this. You know, State Department knew from May that it needed to start getting its people out and it needed to start getting the SIVs out. And instead, we had this last minute push where everybody says they're caught off guard and it puts service members at risk. There was a general sentiment in the building, and nobody will say this publicly, that this was always going to have to be a mess that the military had to clean up. And it became that at the cost of U.S. service members' lives. Uh, Kristen Ruby, if I could just come to you for a moment to talk about the social media aspect of this. Uh, we know that uh, one of the Gold Star mothers, uh, Shana Chappelle, had her Instagram account suspended or by Facebook, the owners of Instagram. And uh, that caused quite an outrage on social media and, and in parts of the, the right-wing media. Um, can you just explain the, the seeming uh, controversy here that, that that's how they treated her, uh, but the Taliban has a Twitter account. How does that work? Exactly. So we have a situation where the Taliban is still uh, very active on Twitter right now, but uh, former President Donald Trump is, of course, banned from all of these social media platforms, and that has sparked a lot of outrage, specifically uh, on the right, which is to say, how can you have a former president of the United States of America banned from these uh, U.S. tech platforms, but yet the Taliban is still using it for their public relations uh, and media strategy, which apparently is a big priority to them, uh, based on the numerous uh, articles written recently that they even have a social media director. And, and what's sort of interesting about their social media strategy is that it's not only top down. It, it, there's a, they have a lot of different volunteers as part of their social media strategy on Twitter. So it would be very hard to effectively just cancel the Taliban's usage on social media because they'll keep popping up with other accounts. So the real question is, is that why were American tech companies use in the communication, specifically WhatsApp. There's a really interesting article about that as well. WhatsApp was critical in rallying the forces in the base within uh, Afghanistan. So why is it that these tech companies 
are actually helping in many ways the Taliban and are not being held accountable. As far as the controversy over that uh, mother and her post being removed, the, the, these mistakes only typically seem to work one, in one direction. And that is usually that they uh, ban someone on the right for saying something. And when that person has a large enough presence, whether this is on Facebook or Twitter or Clubhouse or any of these other social audio mm. platforms, when they cause a, a big stink of a, enough of a stink of it, then suddenly they say, I'm sorry, we've, we've reversed our decision. How many times do we need to see these fake mistakes happen for someone to say there needs to be more political diversity in the people who are creating policy for okay. these big tech platforms. All right, so specifically, how is it that the Taliban and others are deemed to be acting within these big tech companies' terms of service, uh, but say Donald Trump or um, uh, Shana Chappelle are not? So the, these, the terms of service really are not as clear as one would think. If the Taliban is utilizing Twitter and they're not actually effectively calling for violence, then according to their terms of service, they're still able to be on that platform. And so what we saw around all of the controversy with Donald Trump being removed from Twitter is it was a lot of things around January 6th and actually uh, the calls for violence that were implicated in that decision. But the Taliban, actually one of the leaders of the Taliban was suspended from Twitter in 2017. They are now back on there and have realized what they need to do and say to not get suspended, which is why that person has not been suspended since then. Okay, well, that's, that's very strange. Fanu Milat, um, we come to you now. The most important thing for you right now is to get your family and loved ones out of Afghanistan safely. Can you tell, give us an update about what's happening with them? Yes, recently I talked to my family members. Uh, they're pretty disappointed at this time. They're very hopeless and they're asking me if there is, if it is possible to get them out of Afghanistan to a safer place. And uh, what I told them was that I'm doing my best, best here in the United States, connecting with private reports, uh, connecting with the State Department through the representatives here in Texas. Uh, and I haven't got any response from the State Department yet, but I have provided the information of my family to the private reports who are still active in Afghanistan, helping people to evacuate. And I still haven't heard from them either yet. So at this point, uh, it's very disappointing. And they're hiding somewhere where I cannot disclose the location. And it's very disappointing. As a former interpreter working alongside US troops, were you ever given any reassurances about the future of Afghanistan or how you would be treated if the worst should happen? I haven't been given any reassurances or any promises, but uh, I have been uh, given uh, recommendation letters from the officers that I work with. And on those recommendation letters, it's being stated that I and my family members are going to be at risk due to my job working as an interpreter for U.S. forces, and we should be assisted or we should be granted SIV or special immigrant visas uh, at any time that we request. And your family, as you mentioned, are in hiding. Do they give you any uh, updates about how the Taliban are behaving? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Recently, my father has received multiple phone calls threatening the whole uh, family to death. And uh, the good thing is that they don't know uh, where they're living currently. And my father has been changing his phone numbers and they're hiding somewhere where no one uh, knows about it. Uh, but looking at the media, my father is uh, very uh, scared and he is living uh, in a state of fear that what, what's going to happen if they find out about the location and what's going to happen to the family members. I read a headline the other day in the Times newspaper here in London that uh, Boris Johnson thought that the, uh, or thinks rather, that the Taliban have changed, can change. There are moderate elements uh, within them. What do you think? Uh, I don't think if they have changed, they're the same people. Uh, and there are people who have been brainwashed for years. I, I think it's... It's very hard to change someone uh, in a matter of a year or a few years. I think there are the same people in looking at 
the new government of Taliban who are uh, going to be governing Afgan Afghanistan. I don't think it, anything has changed. There are some people. Christian, I think you want to come in. Yeah, so I, I think what's interesting about this is that they really are trying to change public perception by utilizing uh, American social media platforms to do so. In many regards, they are trying to engage on a rebranding campaign of the Taliban in and of, of itself. Uh, however, as we know, uh, just because they're trying to rebrand or repackage what their brand looks like doesn't mean that, in actuality, it's any different at all. It could have a different package, it could have different messaging, but it could still very well be the same Taliban at the end of the day, which is, which is what I think David's saying and, and what I certainly agree with as well. David, you were talking earlier about how there are hundreds uh, of Americans and, of course, thousands of American uh, allies and assistants uh, left behind. Um, what is going to happen with them I think the administration worries a great deal about that. And they are dealing, as Kristen is saying and you're saying, with the Taliban that's much more sophisticated in terms of communications. Uh, they've learned a lot from their mistakes. And I agree with Kristen. doesn't mean they've changed. Look, the real nightmare scenario is that the longest war, you, we were never going to exit the longest war successfully, a, a war that you can argue we lost. So we have that reality. But the worst scenario is this keeps going, that there's a hostage situation. Remember, they're California school kids. Why school officials would send kids to Afghanistan is beyond me. But they're still stuck there. And they're Americans that they're trying to get uh, out of the country through ways I won't talk about on the air. And you see they got four people over land to the north. But this thing, this thing could keep going. And it, it, it is indeed a nightmare for the administration in terms of competence. They want to get past this. They have enough multiple crises on other fronts. Tara, what happens to the, the people left behind? Uh, when you go to the Pentagon briefings, this must be uh, a subject that is raised constantly. It consumes those briefings. And I, I would like to push back just a moment on uh, David's point that there was no successful way to end America's longest war. I was in Baghdad monitoring the drawdown from Iraq in 2011. And that was a year-long, thought-out process where they literally had PowerPoint slides for everything in the country, the number of containers, the, the number of people, the number of contractors. And that drawdown was executed successfully without having uh, this mass chaos at the very end of it. So I would just like to point out that it is very possible that this could have been handled a different way. And this talking point that the Biden administration has it like it couldn't have happened any other way is just not true. So about the people left behind, that has consumed every briefing. And what the Department of Defense says is that this is no longer a military mission and that there is no military role in getting them out. This is and was a State Department role to not only secure passage for those people, but to make sure that all of the diplomatic channels were open so that if you have a chartered flight and you have passengers aboard, you can check the manifest, you can get the flight out, and you can get it cleared to land. I mean, that is what is happening right now with these six chartered flights in Mazar that are stuck. You know, it is partly a Taliban uh, information operation where they're saying, oh, we would let them go, but you know, there's these issues. The Taliban are stopping the planes. But the State Department has also, um, as some of my colleagues have reported, actively stopped those planes from departing by not giving them an, a country that they are cleared to land and telling them that they are prohibited from landing at a DOD base because they don't know who's on the plane and they consider it a security risk. So this, you know, this could have been handled a lot better and until all of those Americans are out and continued hope for the Afghans who worked for us are out, yeah. uh, this will be one of the, the key questions of his administration. Yeah. Um, I would, you know, you, would, you initially asked about, you know, isn't Biden the, the comforter in chief and his, his ability to be empathetic? And for years, you know, after Bo Biden died, a lot of us wondered how close a personal relationship he had to the war because if that military service was likely tied to Bo Biden's death due to toxic exposure. And he has been able to connect with these military families. But he is much more comfortable and much better mm. at domestic comfort and domestic issues. And you've seen him turn hard right to all of the global, the, the climate change and all of the destruction in some of our, our cities in the US, where he's much more comfortable putting his arms around a family who's lost their home due to a natural disaster, rather than what has happened in Afghanistan, which was very much caused by the, the decisions he made in the early months of his administration. 
Yeah. Uh, Fanush, we've been talking about Joe Biden, whether or not he is the uh, compassionate man that he portrayed on the campaign trail, the uh, empathizer in chief and so on. Uh, just a final answer from you then. Uh, what would you, how would you judge his attitude towards all the Afghans who helped the Americans who have been left behind? I see him as a very irresponsible and a person, a leader who is not serious uh, with the job he's doing. Uh, a real leader, leader of a country, especially a free country like United States, would never leave the men, the allies, and their families behind in the war zone. Well, for Numalat, David Morey, Tara Kopp, and Kristen Ruby, thank you all for your contributions to The Nexus today. Much appreciated. And thank you at home and on your phones for watching. If you want to see this episode again or any of our previous episodes, do go to our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Till next week, then. Goodbye. <laughs>